This video is brought to you by Squarespace. When it comes to websites, online stores, etc., there's no place to build a beautiful online presence like Squarespace. Hey dweebs, I mean, dwe uh, welcome back to another episode of What I Watched This Month, July Edition. I know what you're thinking, Karsten, did you really just make one video in between now and the last What I Watched This Month? Are these the only videos you do anymore? Listen, I just had a really busy month and was filming a short film that took a lot of work and I just, you know, shit happens. But I'm back and I'm here to talk about some movies and not make anyone upset. I started the month by rewatching Goodfellas. I feel like just saying that itself is putting me into some real fun territory. But upon a rewatch, I really loved this. Um, a lot. I think a big part in why it didn't click for me the first time was just how much was happening and my taste then was also dramatically different and more narrow than it is now. Because something about this second viewing just really stuck with me. I think this is not only a fantastic gangster flick, obviously, but it's also a gangster flick that breaks all the walls that films like that would usually confine the film in. It's a beautiful movie about the American dream that still remains, uh, extremely cool. And it's hilarious. Like, seriously, I forgot how great of a sense of humor this thing has. Yeah, I loved this a lot. This is a great movie. I still think After Hours and King of Comedy are better, but it's, uh, moving on. Then I watched No Sudden Move, a crime movie that is good, but actually does not manage to break down any walls whatsoever. Seeing as though this had a loaded cast and was directed by Steven Soderbergh, I was very eager to check it out. But like everything I've been watching by Soderbergh recently, I just feel like it was missing something. Like, it was fries without the salt. They're fries, no doubt, but without salt, it really makes it hard to you know, want another bite. I also think it's just unnecessarily confusing at times. Maybe that's just me, but it really kicks itself off assuming the audience knows more than they do. Sometimes that works. It's nice to watch a mystery unfold, but this wasn't doing nearly enough to make me care all that much. No sudden move, more like no country for old men, but not as good. Then I watched The Boss Baby 2. Bad, 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 bad. Then I watched Robert Altman's Nashville for the first time. I've had the Criterion copy for this for a little over a year now and have been patiently waiting for the quote unquote right time. It's a very long movie where a lot of characters are doing a lot of things and I just wanted to be fully attentive for it. And after having seen it, I am glad I took that time to watch it. This is definitely very big and very full and very smart, like a much smarter movie than I will be giving it credit for in this video. I think naturalism in film is something I gravitate towards a lot, but Nashville seems to just summarize what is so magical about that way of making movies. It's not about being authentic for the sake of being authentic, it's a filmmaker's vision of a memory and of their reality. It feels not only like the most personal way of watching a movie, but also like the most nostalgic. Nashville is a movie that presents you with such an authentic portrait of the 70s that it leaves you with the confidence to say it's an accurate portrayal of the 70s without ever Ever living through the 70s yourself. And you know what? I think there's something beautiful about that. Then I watched Zola, and uh, this is a weird ass movie, isn't it? I love movies that get weird and a little self indulgent and manage to do it all in a short runtime, and that's what Zola does. I also think it's super funny, like maybe the funniest movie of the year so far, which I don't know how much that's really saying considering there haven't been a lot of funnies this year. I think where Zola falls short for me is the complete detachment I had to the characters. I feel like we spend enough time with Zola and Derek, and I guess the rest of the crew, but the only emotion I felt towards any of them was a sense of discomfort whenever Coleman Domingo's character was on screen. I cannot think of a worse way to take a piss. My friend described it as scrolling through Twitter but in film form, and I think she kind of hits the nail on the head with that. I'm entertained, and it's very easy to get sucked into it, but I never felt anything for anybody, which isn't an issue, I guess, if you're entertained, but it's not a movie that stuck with me afterwards in any real way. Zola shows you a lot, but what is it saying about any of it, you know? I do think I'll revisit it at some point, but as of now, it kind of just uh, is what it is. Nicholas Braun, need I say more? Then I watched Paris, Texas. I was dreading getting to this part of the video the whole time because man, is this movie hard to talk about. Like, can't I just say it's great and move on? Do I have to talk about it? Where do I start? Harry Dean Stanton is just unbelievable in this. You can see the whole story of this character with just his eyes. The way he walks even tells you so much. For as loose as the film feels, everything is so tight and intentional. It really enhances the idea that you're entering someone's personal worldview. And yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a movie that talked about loss and regret as honestly as this did. Do I really need to say anything past that? Movies like this, I feel like you should just kind of watch it and let it sit with you, or at least that's the excuse I'm giving myself for why I can't seem to talk about this movie. Then I rewatched Christopher Guest Waiting for Guffman, a significantly lighter watch. I only gave it four, but I don't know what I would uh, change about this movie. It's got my favorite kind of humor, where the joke is sometimes just an eyebrow raise or a certain way someone steps into frame. The worlds that Guest makes are so goofy in and of themselves that it really doesn't take 
take much for something hilarious to unfold. It's just a really great mockumentary with funny performances all around. Then I watched Spree. I've wanted to see Spree for so long, and having finally seen it, I don't really know what I was actually expecting, but it wasn't this. It's very goofy and kind of stupid, but I'm glad it's that. Because if you're gonna make a movie about influencer culture, specifically about the kinds of people who really want to be a part of that culture and aren't, this is kind of the most logical route to go with it. It finally feels like I got to watch a movie about the internet, made by someone who uh, actually uses the internet. It's a serious subject with lots to dissect from, of course, but it's also something you should be having a lot of fun with, and Eugene Cutliarenko sure does do that. As a horror movie, I also think there are some really creative kills here and there too. I just think it's a great movie that, for as familiar as this subject is, felt like nothing I had ever seen before. Then I watched Pig and kinda loved it. It's this new Nick Cage movie about a man trying to find his massive hog and it Sorry. And it rules! There is some revenge stuff going on here, but it focuses more on a man forced to confront his past to process this extreme loss in his life. Yes, it's about the pig, but it's also about learning how to become. I know that sounds pretentious and a little cheesy, but I think this movie is honestly one of the most comprehensive tellings of that kind of story. I feel like I'm watching a very real person on the screen. Nick Cage's attention to subtlety does a lot for how authentic it all feels. I just had a really good, sad time at the movies with this one. It's crazy that my top three movies are all about pigs. Pigs. Then I watched the Spongebob Squarepants movie for I want to say the 60th time and of course I loved it. This is one of two movies where I can recite the entire thing like it's a song. I've genuinely seen this movie too many times. Then I watched The Woman Who Ran. This is my first Hong San Su movie and I kinda love this style. It really reminds me of Chantel Ackerman with how much she is able to do with so little. The people in this movie really just kind of exist. By movie standards, nothing really happens, but to the main character, putting myself in her shoes, the sequence of events feels like the kind of thing that, if it happened to me, I'd look at it as an important part of my life that'd make me go, they should make a movie about this. My personal interpretation is that, while she isn't literally running in the movie, her idea of running is existing as herself in the world rather than with her husband for the first time. She's running with the current, not towards anything in particular. And I think making a movie about someone coming back to the world around them rather than departing into something grander is actually very beautiful and worth telling. I don't know if I said anything just now, but that it's a good movie. Then I watched The Cat Returns. This is cute and is uh, super funny a lot of the time, but it is absolutely one of the most average movies Ghibli has ever made. Definitely not bad, but it's just kind Kinda like, yeah, it's a movie about cats. Way better than that other movie about cats, but it's about cats, and I don't know if it's actually about anything else. Then I watched the Anthony Bourdain documentary, Roadrunner. I'll start by addressing the popular controversy surrounding this film. I have mixed feelings about it. If you didn't already know, this movie uses AI to make Anthony Bourdain say something um, for the sake of the movie. And on one hand, that voice was used for a letter he wrote, so it wasn't like they were putting words he didn't say in his mouth. But on the other hand, Bourdain was clearly a man who was very specific about what he said, and I think regardless of that, it's still ethically questionable to have someone say something without their consent, especially in a documentary about their life. But that aside, I do think this is a really well-made documentary. I wasn't too familiar with Bourdain before this, I didn't really watch his show a lot, and this felt like a very well-organized documentary that enlightened me on his career and psyche. In my opinion, it doesn't feel like it's trying to solve his death, rather it's trying to understand who he was as a person leading up to it, trying to shed light on who he was all along in a rather respectable way. It honestly just felt like a lovely ode to someone who couldn't help being the way they were. I felt very moved by the end of it, and unlike a lot of documentaries, it's one I really have not been able to stop thinking about at all. And I watched Old and, uh, oh boy. Let's keep this simple. This is a very fun movie. I don't know if it's a good movie, there are a lot of very odd framing choices done here and there, and I do not agree with anyone saying the performances in this are great, but something about it, even if these choices read as kind of weird on the surface, they all work. It's definitely a great execution for a concept like this, and I was shocked way more than I expected to be, which is always nice. I think it just starts in a really awkward place and sticks the landing in a really dumb place, but everything in between is just so much fun. I'd happily rewatch it again, even if, I don't know, I can't call it a great movie. Then I watched Space Jam 2, and boy oh boy, uh, did I hate this one. I get that it's for kids, a lot of it knows what it's trying to do, and I did go into it knowing that it's Space Jam, not 
Citizen Kane or some shit, but even with low expectations, I ended up really hating this movie. It's like the emoji movie with self-awareness and a bigger budget. I went to Universal Studios once, and the little videos they play before you get on the roller coasters were about the same level of quality as this was. Why is it two hours? Why is his son the villain? Why is Porky rapping? I can have fun with cheesy movies from time to time, but this was pretty close to being completely unbearable for me. Honestly, I'm gonna say it. It made me hate movies. And hey, that's what I watched this month. I did watch some other stuff at the end there, but because I want to get this video out sooner rather than later, I'll be touching on those uh, next month. So yeah, thanks for watching. Check out all these films and form your own opinion. And before you head out, I'm so sorry. I don't know why my hair looks like this, but I want to give a quick thank you to this week's sponsor, Squarespace. Now, Squarespace, if you didn't already know, is a place where you can go online to build your brand, whether that be through an online store, a blog, a portfolio, you name it. They have a wide array of award-winning designer templates that'll make your website look fantastic, unlike my hair right now. And if you have any issues, they have 24-hour customer service to walk you through it. My cousin just started using it, and he said so far he's been loving it. And if he loves it, you're going to love it. The best part about it all is that if you go to squarespace.com slash Karsten, you can get 10% off of your first purchase. So overall, there's really no reason not to give it a chance. So thank you again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Thank you guys for watching. Sorry again about my hair, and I'll see you all in the next one.